Welcome back for yet another physics lecture. Today we're going to be looking at particle physics, and this will be our last substantive lecture. After this, it'll just be review. So we didn't go over much in quantum physics, and we didn't talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but it plays an important role when we talk about quant or about particle physics. In fact, particle physics, to do particle physics calculations, you have to know a lot of quantum mechanics and then a lot of other hard math. So Werner Heisenberg was one of the two originators of quantum physics. There were two separate formulations. One was the matrix formulation that was done by Werner Heisenberg. And then there was Schrodinger's wave formulation. They were done completely separately. And Werner Heisenberg, he came up with this because he was really frustrated because they couldn't identify what's the position of an electron. And so he kind of gave up on that and said, okay, what things can we determine about what's going on in an atom? And so he started listing things, you know, charge and um, magnetic moment and, you know, everything that could be measured, things we call observables. And then he started organizing these in tables and he took this to his, his <clears throat> advisor and his advisor, frankly, didn't know what to make of it, but he sent it off to a mathematician. He said, oh yeah, 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 this is just matrix math. <laughs> and that's how the matrix formulation was developed. Well, two years later, he published his famous uncertainty principle, which comes in two common flavors. Now, there are a lot of uncertainty relations. Anytime you have, oh boy, I got to sneeze. <laughs> um, anytime you have two observables that we say don't commute, you can't know them both at the same time with arbitrary precision. And now we're not going to worry about what those are, but we have two pairs that I've shown here. And you would think that all uncertainty relationships were H bar over two, but they're not. It just happens that these two are the same. So the first one, this is the one that most people know. It's position momentum. And what this means is that if I have a particle like an electron, and I develop a measurement technique where I, I know its position to a very small uncertainty. So my delta x is that width of its uncertainty and position. The smaller I get that uncertainty, the bigger my uncertainty is going to be in what its momentum is. Now, this seems, it seems counterintuitive. When I was in college, I thought, well, okay, let's just focus on the position. I measure, measure the position now, and then sometime delta T later, I measure the position again. Couldn't I say then that the momentum is equal to X2 minus X1 over delta T? And I can't say that. That's the average momentum between the two, but... I don't know the momentum at this time or the momentum at this time. I know the average between the two. And at the time that I make the measurement, I'm changing the system. A fundamental thing in quantum mechanics is a measurement changes the system. When we studied polarization and we saw that when we put two cross polarizers, no light gets through. But if we put one at the angle in between, then light gets through because it changed the system. That's what a measurement does to our system. And so I could know the position exactly here, the position exactly here, exactly to some arbitrary small uncertainty. And I could know the average momentum in between, but at this position, I don't know what its momentum is. At this position, I don't know what its momentum is. I just know the average in between the two. And so what this says is, no matter what you do, the best you can possibly get for uncertainty product between the position and the momentum is h bar over two. So in any reality, you probably have a bigger uncertainty. And actually, you can show this mathematically using um, Gaussian distributions to, to, you know, well, if you're taking quantum mechanics next year, you'll do that. You'll derive the uncertainty relation using Gaussian distributions. So that's... That's the one people usually know about. And it leads to jokes like, you know, 
Schrodinger and and Heisenberg and uh, I forgot who the next one is. Some psychologist are in a car and they get pulled over and the policeman says, do you know how fast you're going? And Heisenberg says, no. And he says, you're going 75 miles an hour. And Heisenberg says, well, great. Now I'm completely lost. Because if he knew his speed, then he knew his momentum, which meant he had no idea of his position. And, and it goes on. <laughs> Checks the trunk. Says, you know, you have a dead cat in there now. <laughs> Schroeder says, well, I do now. It's, it's, it's a very nerdy joke. So this... <sighs> This whole quantum mechanics thing is somewhat troubling, right? Because everything we did before quantum mechanics is, was what we call deterministic. If A happens, then B is going to happen. And quantum mechanics is probabilistic. This is what's likely to happen. And you have things like this. You can't know exactly what the position and momentum are of a particle. And this led to great people like Einstein saying, I don't believe that God placed dice with the universe. Now, whether Einstein believed in a God is up for discussion. But in this case, we said, I don't believe God plays dice at the universe. He meant, I don't believe that nature is random. And, you know, the probabilistic nature, the fact that things are just based on probabilities in quantum mechanics, it really pushed him the wrong direction. He thought that it must be that we just don't have good enough calculational ability or not good enough measuring techniques. But as we understand things, the fundamental nature of quantum mechanics, fundamental nature is that things are based on probability and they're not absolute. They're not deterministic. So that's the uncertainty relation. And then we have another one, the energy time relation that says your uncertainty in energy multiplied by your uncertainty in time is always greater than h bar over 2. And that we use in particle physics a lot. And so we'll see that coming back and we'll do a calculation with that coming up. Now, just when we get into particle physics, we're talking about small and smaller particles. We want to remember just a starting point. What is the root word for atom, which is atomos, mean in Greek? Remember Democritus had, if I take this thing and I cut it into two pieces, then I'm going to have a smaller piece, another smaller piece that I'm going to disregard. And I can cut that smaller piece into two pieces. Well, that was supposed to be down the middle. And then I'll have an even smaller piece, and I can cut it in half, and I'll have an even smaller piece. And if you keep going on, eventually you'll get to a smallest indivisible piece. And that was the atomos, the atom. Well, Further study has indicated that the atom is not fundamental. So if we follow the work of Democritus, he says the solid we can break into smaller things. And eventually we get down to molecule, a collection of atoms that are held together. But the, the molecule has atoms, but the atoms have a nucleus with electrons, and the nucleus has protons and neutrons. And usually that's where people stop. You have the proton, the neutron. But the proton or neutron is actually, as we now understand it, made up of three things that we call quarks. And so this is showing a nucleon and the small quarks that it's made of. And the quarks, we believe, are fundamental. Fundamental, another word for fundamental is elementary. So the quark is a fundamental or elementary particle. As we understand it, you cannot break the quark up into smaller pieces. Now, there's this little glue on here that is another particle, but it's not part of the quark. So when we talk about particle physics, we're talking about these little tiny things that make up matter. And when we talk about elementary or fundamental particles, we're talking about the smallest particles that everything's made of. There's a lot of things that really boggle the mind in particle physics. And one of them is a complete reformulation of how forces work. How does gravitational force work? Up to now, you know what? We have not addressed that. We've just said gravitational force is a force that acts between any two particles with mass and is always attractive. 
and it's proportional to the product of the gravitational charges that we call mass. Well, it turns out that a new way to think about forces is that forces are mediated by a particle. So here we have two protons. Now we know that protons having a like charge are going to repel. And a way to talk about the force is to say that proton number one gives off a photon. The photon has no mass, but it has momentum, has energy, and it travels over and it gets absorbed by this photon. And when it's absorbed by this photon, it makes that photon move. So we have this written out in pieces. It moves across. Here it's arrived. And now the second um, proton is rebounding. We call this particle here a virtual photon. What makes it virtual? <laughs> it's virtual because we don't observe it. And I know, you like, you don't observe it, then how do you know it exists? Well, we can, calc we can do some calculations to say that there is something that travels between them. So this virtual photon mediates the electromagnetic force. So this eyeball here doesn't see it because it's virtual. That's what that picture is illustrating. Now, Hideki Yukawa proposed that there was a particle that he called the Yukawa particle, or that at least became known as the Yukawa particle, that would allow a proton and a neutron to change. And so here's an example. You have a proton neutron. The proton breaks into two pieces, a neutron and this pi plus particle. But that pi plus particle then travels across, gets to the neutron, and the neutron that it hits gets converted into a proton. And Yukawa was able to calculate, okay, the range of this force is really short. And if the range is really short, then it must be a high energy particle. He calculated what the energy of that particle was and scientists searched and sure enough, they found it. And so the Yukawa particle, we now know it as the, the pi meson. Meson means a particle of intermediate mass. And we'll learn more about the meson coming up. But that was, at least as far as I know, that was the first of the idea of these subatomic particles mediating the force. Now, how do we determine things like the range or the lifetime of these particles when they're looking for it? Well, here's a graph that shows, it says probability of interaction. This is from experimental data. And if they collide um, the um, proton with a pion and they increase the energy, they find that you have a strong interaction here at about 200 MeV. And the full height half width is about 100 MeV. So what they say is that we have an uncertainty in energy that would be on the order of 50 mega electron volts, right? Because it's plus 50 and minus 50 of 200. And so then they say, aha, we have a mass or an energy of 200 MeV with an uncertainty in energy of 50 MeV. Well, using that uncertainty relation, delta E times delta T must be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And so they say, we can calculate then, calculate then its lifetime because if the uncertainty of energy multiplied by the uncertainty of time is smaller than h bar over 2, then we can't definitively say that we have a violation of conservation of energy. And so you just calculate, you take the limiting factor of h bar over 2, and you say the lifetime is, well, is on the order of h bar over 2 delta e. So what is h bar? 
in electron volts, that's 6.5821 times 10 to the minus 16 electron volts times seconds. And then we'll have over 2 and then times 50 mega electron volts, so 50 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. And so if we just pop that in the calculator, and I'm quickly trying to get my computer to do the calculation because I did not do the calculation beforehand. 6.5821 e minus 16 divided by 100 e to the 6 gives us 6.5821. Five eight times ten to the minus twenty four seconds. So the lifetime that's predicted for this particle is extremely short. How do we measure something with that lifetime? We cannot. What we can measure is the energy width, and we infer then the lifetime for this product's decay. So that is an application of the uncertainty relation for identifying the actual properties of a particle. Now, Richard Feynman, he died when I was in college. He was the youngest scientist to work on the Manhattan Project, and he is largely um, considered the greatest mind of, well, I would say our generation, but not your generation. Um, his his biography is entitled Genius, just to give you some idea of how he is respected. He's, he's put in the same category as Einstein and Newton. He came up with a way to draw diagrams to illustrate how particle interactions are occurring. So here is a diagram that shows time on the vertical axis. Sometimes you have these reversed and position on the horizontal axis. And so you have these two protons that are coming toward each other. But then the first proton emits a virtual photon and rebounds. Sometime later, so it's at a higher time, the second proton absorbs that virtual photon and it rebounds. So that is a diagram showing how the particle interaction works. Now, this diagram is shown conveniently in that, well, sure, if this was a ball, if I am this part positive particle and I throw a ball, I'm going to rebound. And then if, if, there, if you're this particle and you catch the ball, you're going to rebound. So that makes total sense. But what if one was positive and what was, one was negative? One was positive and one was negative, then the picture would have been... It would have pulled them together, right? And so it's not as simple as the idea of throwing a ball because that virtual photon could make it rebound in the same direction it went. Life is full of confusion. So that's one example. Here's another example, the one showing the Yukawa particle, the pi plus meson. So you have the proton, and it ejects this pi plus and rebounds now as a neutron. And then there's another neutron, it absorbs that pi plus and rebounds as a proton. So those Feynman diagrams are ways that we can illustrate what's going on in a collision. We can see what's happening, not in real time, but as a time sequence. We're going to come back and look at this later on. But as scientists started studying atoms and other particles, they noticed certain, certain relationships and symmetries. And so Murray Gell-Mann developed, um, what is it called, the eightfold way? <laughs> I got to get the number of folds right. I was going to look this up before. The eightfold path. <clears throat> As a way of categorizing or organizing these particles. And in that path, he had charge and he had spin and he had this thing he called isospin and it, it basically it's an organizational chart 
But based on this organizational chart, Murray Gellman said, there must be some fundamental particles, some smaller particles at the very least, that protons and neutrons are made of. The protons and neutrons aren't themselves fundamental. And so Murray Gellman came up with the term quark. Now, I say he came up with the term quark. The term quark was actually a nonsense word from Finnegan's Wake. The quote is something like, and three quarks for Muster Mark, or something like that. Or maybe it's four quarks for Muster Mark. I, I don't know. Now, independently, George Sly also was studying these and decided that there were these particles that make up protons and neutrons. And Sly wanted to call them aces. Um, Murray Gelman, very whimsical in his naming. And so the world went with Murray Gelman. And so we have quarks, the fundamental particles that make up protons and neutrons. So here is a neutron. The neutron has three little quarks in it, one that we call up, one that we call down. In the first discovery that there were these subatomic particles, the, the subproton, subneutron particles, they thought that there were only two types. And so two types, you know, we could call them plus and minus maybe, but that was already taken in charge. Um, north and south was taken up with magnetism. So they chose up and down. And <clears throat> so we have up quarks and down quarks are the kinds of things that protons and neutrons are made of. And a neutron is an up, down, down. A proton is an up, up, down. And in further studying, it's been determined that an up quark has a charge of plus two thirds, and it has an approximate mass of 0 0.002 giga electron volts per C squared. The down quark has a little more than twice that mass and a negative one third charge. And now we have the confusion, but didn't we say that all charge comes in integer multiples of the electric charge, and this is not an integer, that's two thirds times the charge of an electron, and minus one third times the charge of an electron. Well, jumping right to something at the end, no quark has ever been found by itself. And in fact, if you put more and more energy in, the idea being you put in more energy and you can pull them apart, what happens instead is you just create more particles because as Einstein said, And it takes so much energy to separate these quarks that we just cannot do it. And instead, we create new particles when we put energy in. Now, this table is like a huge portion of all of our knowledge in physics. We have our fundamental particles. The group called fermions are particles with one half integer spin. And because they have those one half integer spins, they have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. So all these fermions have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. And we have the quarks. The quarks are the things that make up protons and neutrons, as well as a number of other particles. And with the first go around, they only identify two, up and down. But then, as we'll see coming up, they observe some strange behaviors, some decays that took longer than they should occur, or some that didn't occur at all. And so they call this strange behavior. And it turned out that it was the result of another one of these quarks, and so they called that the strange quark. So those were the first two, the up and down. Then the second one to be hypothesized and isolated, no, not isolated because it's never been found alone, but to be described was the strange quark. But then they had a theory about some symmetries. So let's go over here to the leptons. Lepton means light particle. Light is in low mass. Not light as in blinded by the light. The leptons are low mass particles 
And the first generation has two particles, the electron, and it says here, lightest neutrino. Back in my day, and in fact, up until about a decade ago, it was called the electron neutrino. But now it's been determined that we have a superposition of different types of neutrinos. It's a little confusing. But that, that electron neutrino was first theorized when they were studying um, radioactive decays, and they saw what looked like a, a loss of conservation of mass and energy. And they said, well, either we're missing a particle or our fundamental ideas. And Emmy Nether had shown mathematically that these had to be conserved. So they said, well, Emmy wouldn't be wrong. We must be missing a particle. And so they called it a neutrino because it was neutral, charged, it would have been easy to find, and light because if it was large, it would be easy to find. And so that's the first generation. They discovered the second generation, a muon and its neutrino. And so they had four leptons. And they said there must be a symmetry between the leptons and the quarks. So if we have four leptons, we should have four, four quarks, but they had not found the fourth quark. And so the strange quark was called strange because it caused strange behavior. Things that, sh that should have been allowed didn't occur. Um, some things took way too long to happen. They said that was strange. And that's how they got the name strange for the quark. But they couldn't find this fourth one, so they called it charm because they said it must lead a charmed life. Well, as research went on, they discovered that there was yet another pair of leptons, the tau lepton. Now, if you look at the mass of the tau lepton, 1.777 gigaelectron volts per C squared, that's way more than the mass of an up or down quark. Um, and in fact, uh, I don't think we have protons, the information on protons, but that's, that's more than the mass of a proton. Um, so it's kind of hard to call it light, but it's the most massive of the three generations of leptons. And so they said, well, there must be then another set of two quarks. And so they call them top and bottom just to get two complementary terms. But now, of course, we have these whimsical names. We have charm and strange and top and bottom aren't so whimsical and so there's alternative names for these top can also be called truth and bottom can also be called beauty and personally i prefer to call them truth and beauty um just it's more fun names it, when i was in college i learned those names and it seems like they've kind of gone out of style but um i always also like when i was in college i thought the top quark it was like the, you know, something amazing, the best quark. And it, it is the highest mass quark, but its name is just, you know, to get two complementary names. So those are what we call the fermions, the leptons and the quarks. And these are fundamental particles. They're basic particles, building blocks. We also have bosons. Bosons are things with integer spin. And bosons do not have to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. So you can have all of your bosons indistinguishable but in the same state. So photons are a gauge boson. These are gauge bosons here. Gauge bosons are bosons that mediate a force. And so the photon mediates this, the electromagnetic force, and it has no mass, no charge. Then we have these three here, the W plus, W minus, and Z zero bosons that mediate the weak nuclear force. We have over here the gluon that does the strong nuclear force. And notice the gluon, it also shows it as having zero mass and zero electric charge. And then we have one more that's not shown, the graviton. Not shown because it has not been observed. Those are the gauge bosons. And finally, there's this Higgs boson. The Higgs boson has a spin of zero. These others had spins of one. So there's a little difference there. And I am simply not well enough versed to go into anything about the Higgs boson. Well, 
these particles mediate forces. And here's some information about the forces they mediate. So gravitational force, we have the graviton that's not yet observed. And it acts on things that have mass. Now it says mass energy because mass is a form of energy. And all particles that have mass will experience this force. It says all particles, but of course, a photon doesn't have mass, hence it's not going to feel a gravitational force. Um, it does have energy, and when you get into relativity, if you bend the space-time continuum, you have a gravitational action on the photon. This bottom thing is the relative strength. If I have two up quarks, and they're separated by 10 to the minus 18 meters. The strength of the gravitational force between them is on the order of 10 to the minus 41. And it doesn't even specify what the units are. I don't care what the units are. I care about relating numbers. If you separate them a little to 3 times 10 to the 17th, so that's 30 times bigger separation, it's still roughly that same force. 10 to the minus 41 is very, very small. If we go over to the weak force, the weak force is a force that acts between quarks and leptons, and it deals with flavor. Well, well, we'll have to talk about flavor coming up. It's mediating particles, as we said above, the W plus, W minus, and Z zero. And notice the strength here. At 10 to the minus 18 meter separation, you have a relative strength of 0.8 which is much, much stronger than gravitational. If you go 30 times farther, it's dropped all the way down to 10 to the minus 4. It's become very weak. Electromagnetic, notice these here are stronger than the weak. So these are ranked in order of strength for very short distances. It only affects electric charge, so electrically charged things. The photon is the mediating particle. And then finally, we get to the strong force. The strong force... What's the color charge? Another thing we'll have to talk about. It acts on quarks and gluons, and it's mediating particles of gluon. Now, how's that? It's mediating particle it also acts on, which means that you can make, in theory, glue balls. You can make a lump of gluons held together by gluons. And look at these forces. That's a very strong force when they're close together. And you pull them a little farther, it gets stronger. Now, what does that mean? With everything else, you pull them apart, it gets weaker. If you pull things apart, that strong force gets stronger and holds it together harder, which is part of the reason we can't isolate a quark. We can't pull them apart because the more you try to pull them apart, the stronger the force is holding them together. That's, that's enough for this chart for now, at least. It'll come back again. So the question about these particles, what are the gauge bosons? Named gauge bosons because they deal with the gauge theory. The gauge bosons are the particles that mediate forces. Now you might have noticed in this list of the gauge bosons, we didn't have the Yukawa particle. Um, we had the gluons that mediate the strong nuclear force. So the Yukawa particle has kind of been reclassified. Now, how do scientists study these particles? By smashing atoms together. Now, you might know the Day Bike Be Giant song, Why is the Sun Shine? And it says the sun is a giant atom smashing machine. Well, here on Earth, we don't have the sun easily controllable. And so we have things like the Van de Graaff. I think it's two A's and two F's. Generator. Wow. You can't read my writing anyway. This was actually developed to be a particle accelerator. If you make this, like, let's say you have your rollers to make this top very positive, and then you put next to it a little tube and you inject protons, those protons are going to then have a repulsive force that makes them zip down here and accelerates them. That's actually what the Van de Graaff generator was developed for. 
This next picture is something that, <laughs> that you're probably a little familiar with if you've watched Ghostbusters. This here is a cyclotron. The cyclotron, you have these two Ds, as we call them, Ds. And they're split, so we usually say split Ds. And you put an external magnetic field. So you see here this B, and so you have a magnetic field that's pointing down in this case. And then you put over here an AC voltage source. And finally, here in the center, you inject charged particles. So, let's see. Yeah. So in this case, we'll say that we have injected, <laughs> I just noticed the arrows. The arrows are gonna be confusing the way they have it. Um, we have injected, the, the arrows are electric field. Let, let's say that we injected electrons right there in the middle. And at the time we inject the electrons, the electric field is going to the right. Well, we know force, and I actually want to add a page here so I can do some work. Page manipulations, add a page, I'll add two just to be safe. So we inject this electron in here, and we have the electric field is going like this. And so the force is going to be force is equal to QE. And since Q is negative E, then it's going to have a net force that's pointing like this. And so it's going to accelerate into the left D. Now, because of this magnetic field, when it gets in the D, we have its velocity is like this, and the magnetic field is into the page. The magnetic field is like this, and using our right-hand rule, the magnetic force is QV cross B equals minus E multiplied by the velocity and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, but we have to figure out the direction. So I have my two directions here. Right hand, index fingers are going to go to the left. Middle fingers point down and my, or point into the screen and my thumb points down. So the V cross B is pointing to the bottom of the page. So to bottom, so there's my direction, but it's negative to the bottom, which means it's actually up. So there's going to be a force that's making it go like that. But as it changes direction, it's going to keep pointing that direction, and it makes it go in a circle. So I am going to have the force net is equal to, well, I'll just put E for the charge of the electron, times V times B, and that should be equal. God's my witness, I did not hit anything to start that. That should be equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is V squared over R. And so we can calculate the radius of curvature as a function of the speed. Now, we can also calculate how long it's going to take to do half a rotation and then it gets over here, it jumps across, does another half a rotation. And what is going to happen is you are going to have the particle continue to speed up every time it goes in one of the, goes between. And so it's going to make the radius bigger every time. And so it's going to spiral outward and keep growing larger and larger in radius until it gets to the very end and it's emitted. Now I made mine just by choosing to inject electrons, mine was going like this. And so mine would be ejecting electrons from here to escape. 
this is showing ejecting protons apparently. <laughs> but that's how this works. Now you have a specific frequency that you have to use with this cyclotron so that every time it goes from here to here, you have had the polarity of this AC voltage switch. So this side was positive, this side was negative when it first started, but then it's going to switch around after it does its loop. So every time it gets to the gap, the polarity will be such that it accelerates across the gap. So there's a certain frequency that we call the cyclotron frequency that it has to be set at. Now I said you might be familiar with these if you watched the, um, the Ghostbuster movie because they have on their backs these little cyclotrons. They're accelerating electrons in theory, and they're shooting out, in theory, electron beams with their little <laughs> unlicensed cyclotrons on their backs. Um, as you might imagine, that would be kind of scary. The first cyclotron was developed by um, Lawrence, and I've actually seen it. It's on display at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and it it looks for all the world like it's a little shoe polish tin. Um, I don't know if you guys are even familiar with those, but when I was a kid, that was one of my Friday jobs, polish the shoes. And so the first particle accelerated this first cyclotron for accelerating the electrons. This is what they use in hospitals, for instance, when they're doing electron um, therapy, that you have a cyclotron to get the electrons up to speed. Now, a synchrotron is a similar idea, but instead of having them go in that split D, you have these stages. And the particle, while it's going through the stage, it goes from positive to negative. And then these are going to be opposite, and so it's accelerated across, and then this one goes from positive to negative while it's inside. It gets accelerated across between each gap. So they go straight at constant speed inside of these tubes, and then they're accelerated when they go between them. These have some advantages in that you can, can tune things and control the speeds and make it so it just goes around the circle. So a lot of your big particle accelerators are using synchrotrons. So for instance, if you go to Loma Linda University and you see their proton treatment center, they're using a synchrotron for their... Um, their proton being there. Here's an example. So I, I've, I've seen the Loma Linda synchrotron. Fermi Lab, they used to run the highest energy um, particle accelerator, their Tevatron, as they called it, because they released, they reached tera electron volts, and they were colliding protons with antiprotons. So they had um, the red is your antiprotons, the blue is your protons. And of course, while these are in one ring, the beams are kept separate. And then they deviate the beams down and make them smash into each other. Kablooey. And for a long time, that was state-of-the-art high-energy physics research where they were smashing protons and antiprotons with enormous energies and observing what particles were created from that energy. So my first year at Union College, we went to Fermi Lab, um, just outside of Chicago, Illinois, and so we were able to take a tour of that. Back when I taught at Pacific Union College, we took a tour of the Stanford Linear Accelerator. The Stanford Linear Accelerator is a straight line version of this. So it's, it's like the synchrotron, except for it's all in a straight line. You aren't repeating, you're not allowing them to go around a circle, but the Stanford Linear Accelerator has been very important in our development of particle physics. And here again, they're showing taking beams that have electrons and positrons and banging them into each other. And what they, when I was there, they were referring to it as a B machine because they were making B particles. It was interesting hearing the students because the people giving us the tour were students. And they said like, yeah, we've got this professor. He goes home at five every day. But he sits there and he tunes his radio to a certain station and he, there's static if the beam is online. If the beam goes online, his static stops and immediately calls us, says, what happened to the beam? Um, the, the beam is a whole bunch of little stages 
the stages at the beginning are very small, but as you go further, they get larger because they're using the same frequency. As it goes faster, you have to have a larger distance for them to travel in the same time. And aligning that thing is really beastly. It was up until maybe three, four years ago, considered the straightest man-made thing ever made, which is extra amazing because it goes under a freeway. We've talked about antimatter, but we haven't really described what antimatter is. Um, Paul Dirac came up with the idea of antimatter, in this case, positrons, which are anti electrons. And the idea isn't as crazy as it tends to sound. There's nothing special about antimatter. Antimatter and matter are only defined as anti because they are identical except for charge. So an anti electron, which we put an E plus, is identical to an electron except for the charge is opposite. But the crazy thing is when matter and antimatter meet, they will completely annihilate and convert all of their mass into energy. So in our table here, we had an example of an electron, whoops, an electron and a positron that meet and they annihilate and create enormous energy. And here they're making those bees. Remember I said the Stanford Linear Accelerator when I went to visit, they were calling it a bee machine because they were making these bee particles. And so that's what um, annihilation is. Annihilation is the complete conversion of mass into energy. So if you have E plus plus E minus, that produces actually, um, I believe it's two photons. Um, and in, in that picture, it showed either Z particle or photon and then the production of the pair of particles. So that's what antimatter is. And Dirac actually had a really interesting theory. Here was his theory. Here's zero energy. Now the rest energy for an electron is 0 0.511. Well, the rest mass, the mass of electron is 0 0.511 MeV per C squared. Um, yeah, I should just put energy. 0 0.511 MeV, that's the rest energy. And down here we'll put minus 0 0.511 MeV. Now Dirac supposed that you had a universe that is just filled with electrons with negative energies. And just like with an atom, electrons with negative energies are bound to the atom. And then he said, but if you have a photon that comes in here, the photon can raise a particle up to here and you have not allowed energies between minus 511 MeV or 511 KeV and 511 KeV. But you could excite the electron from this point to this point. Then you have a free electron. And here you have a missing electron, which he said that positron is just a missing electron. And of course, if the positron and the electron meet, then the electron would simply fall back down and give off you know, light energy equal to the change in energy. So that, that theory is called the Dirac C. And it's, let's call it a model because it's not believed to be a correct explanation, but it's something that's kind of easy to understand that relates to our understanding of energy, electron energy levels in an atom. So here we have a picture showing, you know, electron and positron annihilating, producing the two photons. The, the reason I had this again was so I could show you that picture of the annihilation. 
Now with particle physics, we have conservation laws become extremely important. So I mentioned this in an earlier lecture, we have energy conserved, that's always conserved. Momentum, that was conserved if the net force equaled zero, right? If the net force wasn't zero, then momentum is not gonna be conserved. Angle momentum was similar if the net torque is equal to zero, then mom angle momentum is going to be conserved. Charge is always conserved. And now we have lepton numbers, which are always conserved. Baryon numbers, which are always conserved. So what are lepton numbers and baryon numbers? Well, let's look here. We have the leptons. These leptons have associated lepton numbers. All of these things, I'm in black, all of these things have lepton number equals one. And their antiparticles will have a lepton number equals minus one. Now we break that up further. These have electron lepton numbers. These have mu lepton numbers. And these have tau lepton numbers. And these are not always conserved. They're, they're conserved in certain types of interactions and not in others. And so I don't think I'm going to talk about the partial conservation of lepton numbers. It's a fairly recent thing that they've discovered that, that neutrinos actually do have a mass and thus they can change flavor or not. Yeah. Change flavor. Okay. So those are leptons. Now quarks, quarks have a baryon number of one third for all the quarks and minus one third for all of the anti-quarks. So they have baryon numbers of one third. And then we also have quark numbers that we'll talk about in a little bit. So when we talk about baryon number, a baryon is something that's made of three quarks. Anything that's made of three quarks is a baryon. Baryon means heavy particle. And so a baryon has a baryon number of one. And so in our conserved things, the lepton number is always conserved, not, not the sub number, but the total and baryon numbers are always conserved. So how do we know anything about these particles? Now I started with, they, they started by observing um, organizational patterns, but now we have so many particles and how do we know anything about them? Well, here's one way. This is looking um, at the pathways of ionizing radiation. So you have a cloud chamber where you have a super saturated atmosphere. And if something comes by and disturbs it, suddenly you'll have condensation and you form a trail. Now this here is, there's an actual photograph you can find it all over the place that this is based on. Um, but this is taking that photograph and drawing the important features. And so you have this particle here initially, and then you have a jerk. Well, when you have a jerk, you know that it had to give off some particle and using conservation momentum, this dashed line is calculated. That's not seen. And you have a continuation of this particle, this one coming off here that then has a distinct jerk giving off this pi minus and you don't see anything at all in that region. But there's still particles traveling there and so they calculate what they were based on what they see here. So here you have pair production. This is in a magnetic field. So things that have a a charge are going to bend. So things that are going this way have a negative charge. Things that go this way have a positive charge. So this here is a positron. This one here is an electron. And so they go through and they examine this and they carefully measure the curvatures so they can find mass to charge ratios. And that that's how a lot of the information about particles has been discovered. Now we talked about the different forces. 
And we can have particles decay by these three forces. There's no gravitational decay here. If it's the stronger the force, the shorter the lifetime before it breaks apart. So strong force is the strongest force, and the lifetimes of those particles are on the order of 10 to the minus 16 and 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So if you go back to our really early calculation, we calculated the time for the particle, and we had somewhere around 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Well, that would have had to have been a decay that was mediated by the strong force because it was such a short lifetime. Um, the weak force is the weakest of these three subatomic forces, and so it has the longest lifetimes, and then the electromagnetic force is in between. You'll notice that there's overlap, complete overlap, between the electromagnetic force and the strong nuclear force there. But some particles that should decay quickly don't. They decay slowly instead. And others, they should decay as far as we can tell, and they don't. And so that was the strange behavior that led to the understanding that there was this strange quark that was partially conserved. Partially conserved means that it's conserved in strong, but not in the weak. So if we have a fast decay, it'll be conserved. But if it's a slow decay, a weak one, it's not. So here's an example of a decay. We have a C or psi particle. Notice it has a negative charge. And we have a gamma. It's a capital gamma. Or not gamma. Lambda. It's capital lambda. With a charge of zero. And then we have the pi meson. And mesons are a quark and an anti-quark. So that bar over it means it's an anti and then it's a U for up. So this is down strange strange is what the C minus is. Up down strange is the lambda zero and down anti up is the pi minus. So let's just look at the properties, charge. So I'm gonna have the charge on the left side was minus one and then I have zero plus minus one. So minus one, zero, minus one. Are those equal? You betcha. One is equal to minus one. So check, it's conserved. Then the baryon number. This has three quarks. Each quark is one third, so that's a baryon number of one. This here is also three quarks, so baryon number of one. This here is a quark anti quark, so that's a one third minus one third. And so 1 equals 1, check, baryon number was conserved. Now lepton number, I shudder to even put this here. No electrons, no electrons, no electrons, no mu's, no tau's. 0 equals 0 plus 0. That one was kind of trivial. Then the strangeness. So for strangeness, we are going to count the stranges. So here we had a strangeness of 1, a strangeness of 1. So that was a strangeness of 2. Here we have strangeness of one. There, there's none, strangeness of zero. That one, not conserved. Now I could have added to this, we could have done up and down as well. So if we did up, we would have had zero and then one plus minus one. Yeah, that was fine. The up was conserved. And if we do down, we had 1, and then 1 plus 1. That was not conserved. So the down was not conserved, and the strangeness was not conserved. What does that mean? It means that this could not decay via the strong force. It had to decay via the weak force. And thus, it had to be a lifetime on the order of, let's say, 10 to the minus 14 seconds. That's somewhere in the middle for this decay to occur.
Um, just a, a picture of Murray Gelman with his natty attire there. Um, he was a fairly hippieish type person, I understand. Um, but he was working on strangeness and then came up with the idea of quarks. And remember, um, George Sveig, I think that's his name, also came up with the idea at the same time independently. So they both get credit for, for the work. Now, experimental confirmation. How do you seek experimental confirmation that a proton, right, and up, up, down, is made up of smaller things? Well, if they hit it with really, really high energy electrons, remember the wavelength for a particle is H over P, that is Planck's constant divided by momentum. And so if you have really high momentum, then you will have a very short wavelength and they can actually see the electrons scatter off of three centers from a single proton. So that indicates there's three objects in there. So there's actually some direct observation. Um, there, there is another more complicated picture in the textbook um, showing how particle streams come off in three directions based on the positions of the quarks. So we do have actually some direct measurement of quarks. Now, I think this will be our next last thing, quantum chromodynamics. Chromo means color. We have three, three flavors of, or yeah, three types of quark, or three types, wow. I was going to the wrong thing. We had six quarks, three generations, up down is the first generation, strange charm is the second one, truth beauty is the third. But of these quarks, each quark comes in three different charges, if you will. And so three charges, well, that's not going to work with the binary systems we had before or the unary system. Mass only had one type of charge, positive, right? And so because our eyes have three kinds of cones, they chose the primary colors of light, red, green, and blue, as the three different flavors you can have for any quark. And furthermore, every baryon, hadrons are particles held together by the strong force. And we break them into baryons, things that are three quarks, and meson, things that are quark, anti-quark pair. So I guess I should put, instead of three Q, I should put Q, 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 not crying. Um, so with the baryons, protons, you have three fermions. When you add the spins for those fermions, the spin can add different ways. But for the ground, the proton, there, there actually is an excited particle that's an up, up, down that's not a proton. And it has a spin of three halves. So the proton is an up, up, down with a spin of one half. And I think it's the delta is an up, up, down with a spin of three halves. I'm going to actually look that up really quickly just to make sure. It's like the delta plus. Um, see, yes, the delta plus is the same thing, but with a spin of three halves instead of a spin of one half. So you add these together and you have spin of one half, charge of two thirds plus two thirds minus one third is one, and a color of blue plus green plus red. And our eyes determine blue plus green plus red is equal to white. And so we say that it's a white color for the baryon. And so this was a proton, a neutron, and up, down, down. And just like with the, uh, the proton, there's the delta zero that is a three halves spin instead of a one half spin version. You add the charges together, two thirds minus a third minus a third gives zero. And the color again is going to be white. It has to have a red, a green, and a blue. So all of our baryons are going to have one red, one green, and one blue quark to give you white. 
Masons, a quark anti-quark, well, the colors, if the colors of the quarks are red, green, and blue, then the anti-quarks are going to have colors of anti-red, anti-green, and anti-blue. Well, what is anti-red? Anti-red is white minus red. Well, white minus red we actually call cyan. Anti-green we would call magenta, red plus blue. And anti-blue um, we would call – wait, I said that wrong. Anti-red is green and blue. Yeah, cyan. Red and green is yellow. So anti-blue is yellow, anti-green is magenta, anti-red is cyan. So you might see those colors as well. But when you have a meson, you have to have color and its own anti-color. So that its colors, again, red plus anti-red equals, I put it like a vector, equals white. This one here, green plus anti-green equals white. So all of your masons are white, all of your baryons are white. Hence our textbook, which it seems like it's just taking a page from Jim Gaffigan, a paler shade of white, I think is what it is. Um, all of our, our hadrons are things that are made up of quarks held together by the strong force. We have baryons and masons. That brings up the idea of a pentaquark. A pentaquark is going to be a particle made up of five quarks, but it would have to be Okay, three quarks can give you white, and a quark anti quark pair can give you white. And so it must be four regular quarks and one anti quark to give you a pentaquark. Yeah. So the pentaquarks, I believe they have been observed today. I certainly have not. So this picture here is just to try to illustrate with colors how we get that idea of they have to all be white. Gluons then, the particles that mediate the force between quarks, they come in color pairs, one color and one anti-color. So these are all different variations of a gluon. And so here we're showing a reaction between a down and a strange and so the down is cruising along and it's red so it gives off a gluon that's red anti-green so the red from this went here and then the anti-green made green for the continuing down so we change the flavor of this quark by kicking off that virtual gluon and then that virtual gluon comes over here, and we had a green strange, and the green and the anti-green give you white, and the red continues on. So the red went on like that, and the green, okay, I'm going to change colors actually so red is red. That, that probably makes sense. So the red goes like that, and the green goes like that. So these gluons can change the color of a quark. So we talked about, about the interaction between a proton and a neutron with that pi meson. And now we're going to look at the same re – so we saw this before. But now we're going to look at it looking at the quarks. And so we have the proton and up, up, down, three different colors. And then we're going to have this up is transferred over here. And we have a down here that's transferred over there. So it effectively is exchanging an up with a down. And it's doing it through this virtual pi plus. So the, the proton in this picture creates the pi plus, which is going to carry away and up and produce a down and then that comes over to the neutron and continues the process particle interactions crazy so just a reminder about our fundamental particles we have the leptons family one the electron and notice this says the electron neutrino instead of the low mass mu and its neutrino tau and its neutrino 
Our textbook is just going with the old school because it's easier to understand. Quarks, the first generation up down, the second generation strange and charm, third generation truth and beauty or top and bottom. And then the gauge bosons, the things that mediate forces, photons for the electromagnetic, W plus, W minus, and Z for the weak nuclear force, and gluons for the strong nuclear force. Now we are just about done. I think this lecture probably is going long. What does this lead us to? In physics, there's this great desire for combining our knowledge to, to try to come up with a theory of everything. And so what we study at this level in physics, three forces, the strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and the gravitational force. We have already achieved this point here. That is, theoretically, people have been able to figure out a way to combine the electromagnetic force and the weak force. If you get up to high enough energies, and so you notice this is just a little over 100 electron volts, the electromagnetic force and the weak force can be combined into one force that they call the electroweak force. So we go from four fundamental forces to three. Now, the next big goal is a grand unifying theory, which would combine the strong force with the electroweak so that all of the forces that are active in subatomic particles are described by this grand unifying theory or gut. But then the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is a theory of everything, a theory that combines gravitational force, electromagnetic force, weak force, and strong force all into one force that we see different manifestations of. Just like when we talk about light and we say light has a wave property and a particle property, light is one thing. And we're just looking at different manifestations when we say it's a wave or a particle. The, go the goal is if we can figure out a, a grand theory, a theory of everything now, that allows us to say, okay, this is the fundamental nature of matter. And when we look at it in this light, we see the strong force. When we look at it in this light, we see the weak force. When we look at this light, we see the gravitation. That's what the goal is. You may or may not know Albert Einstein. He felt irrelevant that he just did nothing after he turned 30. He worked, he did a lot of good work on quantum mechanics. He was trying to develop a, a grand unifying theory. It just didn't get anywhere. And it, it, he felt, felt defeated. Well, that ends any new material. I will just be doing review lectures from here on out. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Bye-bye.